Good morning or good evening, depending on whatever shift your seniority allows you to hold. I'm William Young, correctional officer and author of When Home Becomes a Housing Unit. Tonight, I'll be your ever so gracious host and the director of dialogue for the duration of this discussion. Allow me to welcome you with warm, unwavering, outstretched and open arms to this week's edition of the Saturday Night Synopsis. Tonight, my brave brothers and sisters, we have an extra special guest that you can see on the screen. He's my first guest, uh, maybe my only guest, depending on how this goes. He is the eminent advocate for the correctional profession and a crusader for correctional officers everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, Correctional One contributor and the host of the popular YouTube channel, Tear Talk, Mr. Anthony Ganji. How you doing, Anthony? Hey, I want to tell you something. Your intro is better than mine. <laughs> you, that, was that scripted? Was that off the top of your head? I, I spent a little time memorizing it, yeah. I got to roll yeah, out the was... red carpet, man, when you're here. Damn, that was good, man. I'm jealous. Hey, thanks for having me. It's an honor, man. We were able to, uh, you know, I, I was able to see what you were posting on your um, Bill, uh, your William Young author page. I didn't know you had all that stuff posted for the show. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Plus, by the way, it's the least I could do. I mean, you're there every time I need you. Wow. So, uh, yeah, every time I've ever needed you, were there for me. So, please, whatever you need from me. Well, I, I just, I want to, before we get rocking and rolling, I want to thank you for your, your, just your tireless efforts for, the, everything you do for the profession, everything you do to get that information out of there, man, it's, it's so valuable. I had a conversation with a guy the other, the other day, and I was telling him that you were going to be on the show. And so he, I want to, before we get rock and roll, and I want to thank oh, you for your work. No, just I'm crazy. put that's, that, no, that's, that's me. I'm putting it on so I can read the comments. Oh, there you go. And, uh, and so he said when he was thinking about joining corrections and becoming a correction officer that he actually watched your channel and it gave him a lot of information and a lot of a lot of helpful tip, tips that that got him to where he is. He said now uh, he's been there a couple of years now, so he's uh, he's starting to get to that burnt out uh, phase. But he said that your channel really helped him in the beginning, and uh, and I wanted to share that with you, man, because you're making a difference out there. Well, by the way, I'm I'm, I'm honored to be uh, able to do something like this. You know, when Tear Talk first started. It started because I was frustrated at how people saw the profession. Like I knew the work that was going on behind that wall. I knew the people I worked with, we have professionals there and the sacrifices that they were making every day. And it just didn't make sense to me how the people on the outside didn't see that. You know, I mean, something as simple as calling us guards and not embracing who we are now, correctional officer. I know some people will be like, oh, Gange, it doesn't matter the title. The title does matter because we need people to recognize that level of professionalism. And I don't think they're going to see that with the word guard and, you know, having the fight to get these brave men, women, uh, brave men and women recognized uh, has been a battle for the last uh, shoot. I've been doing this now for maybe six years. Um, and it's a battle of equality. I want people to realize that the work that's being done by these brave men and women are law enforcement. You know, what they're doing is they're enforcing the rules, the regulations, the laws that, you know, people must abide by. We don't call for the police when we're behind that wall. We handle the job ourselves. But in the process of doing this, what, what, what kind of surprised me, Will, was that uh, I started having a lot of people that wanted to enter the field or that were new to the field. And I think they started finding us out through searches. Like they may have been on YouTube or they may have been on uh, Google. And Tear Talk started earning a spot in that. I think that's because... Corrections One kind of has um, a control a little bit of the correctional algorithm. So that actually helped the show get discovered. And it was great because we eventually developed a community that was able to help these new boots who wind up entering the field with a lot more knowledge, which in the long run is like, hey, the people that are coming into this profession now are being given more knowledge that are walking next to the people that have experience. So it's really... Um, Humbling to know that in the process of doing this all, that we're creating a great learning environment that's ultimately going to make the facility safe and secure. But it is a passion of mine. You know, I I love this profession. I I, I love the people in it. And uh, we're underdogs. And I'm doing my best every day, as long as yourself, Russ Hamilton, Connie Eileen, Louis Soto, uh, Daryl Smith. I mean, the list goes on. We're doing it every day to make sure people know that we're we're working you know, and we're doing stuff that most people cannot do. No, so it's an honor to be able to have a voice in that. No, you're doing great, man. If there was to be a Mount Rushmore of correctional officers, well, it probably wouldn't be a mountain. It'd be like a, a bluff, like a, a bluff in the middle of nowhere. But if they were carving 
correctional officers on the side of that bluff, you would be you'd be right there, my friend. You'd be <laughs> you're you're one of 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 a million, man. So, uh, you, like I said, it, it, those of you who are familiar with the with the channel, and I think it's so important because you you know when people go through the academy, they get the book version of what corrections is. They get the policies and procedures, and and, and Tier Talk offers them a, a, a look through through the eyes of the veterans through the eyes of people who have walked in their shoes and, and kind of, I feel, bridges the gap between what they get in the academy and then where they actually need to go. So. Yeah, well well said, Will. I, I think what's cool about Tear Talk is we have a lot of people with experience that come on, but don't just come on. They're also part of that community. And they share that experience with uh, those that are getting ready to enter the field or new to the field. And here's my biggest worry in corrections, and I'm sure our audience here would agree with this too, is that we're losing out with people with experience. I mean, there's a lot of people that are also retiring that have all this knowledge. And I'm thinking like, hey, guys, if you're willing to put that voice onto our venue, let's do that. I don't want to lose out on that. That's where Russ Hamilton came. I mean, think about this. Russ has been my boy for many years, Right. His knowledge is phenomenal. Now, if we didn't have a venue like Tear Talk, we would lose all this intel. Right. You know, look what you're trying to do right now with your show. This is a great way to make sure that we keep that experience alive. We keep that information alive. And also it motivates these people that have collected this knowledge in the course of 30 years. Then when they retire, they feel that they lose a sense of purpose. They really do because they've gained all this knowledge and they want to kind of do something back in this profession, but they don't know how. So venues like this provide them that opportunity. And it's very rewarding. I mean, to see people that are listening to them. And, and, and the cool thing is, and William, I think you would agree with this, is that if you get someone that wants to learn, because those are the people that check these channels out. They're, they're searching for a reason because they want to learn something. And you partner them with people that want to teach. It's a great dance. Right. It's a it's a great dance, right? No, I. I why why do you think that? So inside the walls, right? When we're walking around, people like you said, people have such valuable information, but they don't want to share it. Why why do you think that that veteran staff is so hesitant to to share their stories? I think for a while, a lot of people really question their worth in this profession. I, I really do. I, I, I think that for a while, people really started believing the hype. They internalized the negativity. Um, you know, as much as we're passionate about who we are and what we do, recognition does matter. You know, even though some people say, well, I'm not in it to be recognized, but it, but it doesn't hurt. You know, it doesn't hurt for someone to come on the outside, know what you do and say, hey, I appreciate you. Because I look for it even right now with the battle with the coronavirus. I'm looking for people to kind of squeeze in corrections you know and right. just to give them that 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 recognition but i think what's going on now is that once you talk to people and you tell them that their voice matters even if it's a one-on-one -on -one or if it's just a big venue like this where they can see other people wanting to speak it motivates them it brings them out of the shadows and puts a little bit of light on them so i guess the key here is that it's recognizing them first and letting them know you have value don't believe the hype don't believe what the media's put out there. Don't believe what even sometimes, you know, our, our partners in law enforcement don't see us as equals. You know, don't believe in that. You know, one of the things I did a video a while back and it was called Corrections is, is not a stepping stone. And what I mean by that is Corrections is a great career. It's a noble career. I mean, I've had my chances to make some left and right during this career, but I just love this profession because of the people. And I just respect the work. It's a community that we keep safe, regardless of what's in the community. It's a community that we keep safe. That's our job. And I remember someone, we were at this event, and I brought a bunch of correctional officers with me to kind of sit at a table uh, where it was like a police event. And this lieutenant, he was from Hackensack, New Jersey. He loved what we did. He, he loved what we do. So it was an honor for him to invite, to invite us to sit at this event. It was a recognition. And I remember when the police were kind of, you know, they were interacting with us because I'll tell you something, because a lot of people don't know what we do, we steal the attention a lot from a lot of places. Even, even you know, if you're sitting there and there's an officer and there's a correctional officer, a lot of people want to know more about what's happening in corrections because it's not knowledge that's out there, you know, and we have a lot of stories, obviously, if we're willing to share it. 
And I remember this one officer, when someone had asked him what he had did, like, what do you, what do, you do for a living? He said, I'm a correctional officer, but one day I'm going to be a police officer. And that's fine. But when we were done, I said, why did you feel you need to add that other part? He goes, what do you mean? I said, you know, he asked you what you were in the moment. I felt that you should have been proud enough to say I'm a correctional officer and leave it at B. He asked you what you are right now, not what you wanted to be. Right. And he goes, and he goes, Gange, I didn't really feel that. He goes, he goes, um, you're right. I go, I felt like that you felt the need to justify why you were in corrections, you know, where well, you don't have to do it. Corrections is a great enough job where you could stand tall and say, what do you do? I'm in corrections. End the statement. That's it. You made your impact and you should automatically get your respect. And the people that don't respect you, it's because they don't know the profession and they don't know what you do. Right. And, it, you know, for me, especially you brought up like during the during this pandemic and all the commercials and all the thank you, first responders. Thank you, firefighters. Thank you, doctors and nurses. And, uh, you know, it, it hurts a little bit when uh, they don't bring up corrections. But when I, I, I put out the call a couple of weeks ago for. Uh, masks because our facility is making us wear masks and, and we don't have enough masks, right? And so there, so I put it out and said, hey, does anybody know how to make a mask? Does anybody know where I can get a mask? And I had, you know, my mother-in-law, my neighbor came over and it's funny, my neighbor is a, I'm a big uh, Denver Bronco fan. I love the Denver Broncos. That's my thing. That's what I do. And my neighbor is a Kansas City Chiefs fan. Um, and up until uh, she made me these masks, I held it against her. But she brought masks over and, uh, you know, for a guy who tries to be, you know, in inside we get kind of hardened a little bit. Uh, it really meant a lot to me that they see, you know, my service and, and, and understand yes. my sacrifice during this. And, uh, yeah, so it, it's out there, but it's just not as prevalent as, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, the, some of these governors that are talking. Uh, some of them mention their correctional staff. And, I, man, I just... I, I, I think that's such an awesome thing, you know? Well, I'm going to tell you something. You actually said something great. Part of that's on us. We need right. to be proud of what we do, which means that any chance we have to talk about our profession, we should welcome that. And we have to be positive, even though we know the negative. Because the problem is we know the negative, and that's fine. But that's not going to help us get people into this profession. Right. You know, because the negative is overpowering. I understand that. But there's also good in this profession. The people that stand with us in this profession are good. Those are good motivators. And we'll go through the rough times. You know, obviously, we'll go through the rough times. But part of what's going on now is that we need to speak up. We need to be proud of what we do. And we have all reason to be proud of what we do. You know, if given the opportunity to say something, especially when you're at an event, let's say, and people from the outside want to know, find your, do something hard. Find something positive that you could put out there. You know, find something that people can relate to. So when they leave, they say, man, I respect that. And here's what I learned, Will. Here's what I learned, guys. If you guys are watching this right now, I'm sure Will will get some of the comments, too, because we do want to answer what you guys got. People will respect the profession by respecting the people first, which means that if I respect Ganji and Ganji is a good person, then the profession he's in is has got to be a good profession because of the person that Ganji is. I learned that. I went, listen, let me tell you something else, too, with Tear Talk. L little, little. When, when I first started doing Tear Talk, I was wondering, you know what, maybe it was about the outside looking at us, right? So my first initial battle, by the way, guys, evolution is purely, it, it's, Tear Talk is purely about evolution, right? You know, you create something new every day to see what works, what doesn't work. And for me, what I wanted to do was I wanted people from the outside to recognize us, right? That was my goal at first. And guys, I used to get so frustrated because I, I think the things that I thought were positive would be so simplistic for people to see. I mean, that was why I created this venue, right? But I, I, I just couldn't find where I needed to be doing that route. Then what happened was I said, well, wait a second, hold on. I know what the problem is. The problem is it's not about people from the outside looking in. It's about us. It's about how we see the profession and how to manifest that out. So Steer Talk actually took a little bit of a shift. We started looking at the internal dynamics. You know, basically, how do we get along with our supervisors? How do we get along with each other? Ultimately, how do we appreciate the profession in order to manifest that appreciation out? 
So right now, guys, if you're in that position to talk proudly about that profession, which obviously you have a right to do so, this is a very hard profession for people to do, do it. Let people see that you love the profession because in the end, if you don't show that love when given the opportunity to speak about it, you can't expect other people who know nothing about this profession to find the positive. Well, you have to show them that. And, and, and then you have to be able to carry that out and let people see that. And here's the deal. You can't find, uh, maybe short of, of the military, I was never in the military, but um, short of, of that, you can't find another group. Of, I challenge you to find a group of people outside of your, of your facility that would literally put their lives on the line for you. I can't even get somebody to help me move a couch outside. You know what I'm saying? But all I have to do is key up my radio and these people th that, that uh, you know, we're not drinking buddies. We don't have any other thing in common except that we're wearing the same uniform and they come running. They have no idea what they're running into, but they're coming to save my life. And to me, that's... It, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a phenomenal thing. And actually, you just hit on something right now. Um, we have a lot of fallen officers right now from the COVID. I'm reading, uh, looks like a fallen officer out of... Uh, uh, USP Atlanta, Jennifer Cox mentioned, this is scary for us because it's an unseen enemy, you know, so we don't know how to protect our brothers and sisters. Uh, but I will tell you something. That's what motivated me to stay in this profession, Will. Uh, when I was in the academy, guys, I knew that this was going to be a career for me. I did. I knew that because the academy put such a... Uh, a closeness between me and my peers. And I think that's what they're supposed to do. I mean, you're supposed to hate the instructors because that brings you together as a group. It's right. just, it's a group dynamic. And I remember at the very end of the academy, and this was powerful for me, we had about maybe a hundred or a hundred something in our academy at the time. And this instructor was amazing. I really loved our instructor. And he brought us into this circle and he kept on telling us to get tight and tight and tight until you couldn't freaking, you know, move. And he goes, that's how it feels behind the wall. And look to the left and right, because this is all you have behind that wall. These are the people that are going to have your back. And to me, it made sense. So when I got into the wall, I realized what motivates me to respond to a code, what motivates me to jump into something that most people wouldn't, is because I love my brother right. or I love my sister. Right. It's not about the money. It's not about anything else. But the fact is, I love them because... I, I'm, I'm close to them because I know at any moment, no matter what ill will we may have towards each other, when shit hits the fan, this person's going to have my back. They, they're going to have my back. And obviously, if you can't, <laughs> you're no brother and sisters of mine. But, but the key here is what motivated me was the fact that this closeness, you're not going to find anywhere else, Will. You hit it right on the box. Right. And I felt that if, this is the funny thing. I felt at any point that if I was to leave this profession, I really felt this. I felt that I'd be abandoned in my brothers and sisters. I felt that, you know what? I, I, this, I can make this mine. I can make the best of this profession. I didn't wake up. I don't have anybody ever worked in corrections. I never woke up and said, this is what I was going to do, but I made it my own. I took the paths. I mean, I'm an administrative level now. You know, I made this profession my own. But the reason why I made it my own was because I connected with the people on this profound level that I just think cannot be given anywhere else. You hit it right on the nail. That's why. Right, that, right that's, that's why I think corrections is there. There was a video that that, that w I did with you a while back, and there was a gentleman on there, and I and I can't remember who it was, but he said that that corrections is a career, uh, not a crusade. And and, and I I don't uh, I don't agree with that because I think that. Uh, like you said, nobody wakes up, nobody as a little kid says, you know what, I want to grow up and be a correctional officer. But but here we all are, our life paths took us here, and, and we were called to, and I don't believe people when they say, I'm just here for a paycheck. Man, that's a shitty place to work if you're just there for a paycheck. Go work somewhere yeah. where, where somebody can't stab you. You know what I mean? Um, but I just, I really think that that it's a calling to be a correctional officer. I mean, like you said, you don't you don't get any of the accolades, you know, and and it's like it's it's like this little secret club that we're all a part of. We all know the benefits of it, but just nobody else outside recognizes it. Right now, guys, if you guys are watching this, if you guys can come over to William Young's author page so I can see your comments, because I'm getting comments from all different spots. And I don't know if we need to have it from the one. So if you guys can come over to William Young's author page, that would help. Um, 
Yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, one of the things that that's great about creating venues like this, Will, is that even with the Tear Talk venue, we're able to give good advice. You know, again, it's balanced from what we have as my, you know, myself and the other experts that come on, but also the community who complements what we provide. Right. That community is so important, guys, because shit, there's a lot of times when we get stuff wrong. We're not perfect. But there's a constructive approach to say, you know what, Gans, that was a good thought. But you know what? You should try it this way. And, and it's great. And we're very humble. Like, hey, that's a great idea. We're open to each other's perspective. That comes out to people that are new. And I think the good thing here right now is that if people are coming into this profession, not knowing what this profession is about, you don't want them finding out when shit hits the fan that, oh, shit, this profession wasn't for me. Right. We're giving them the opportunity to find out now through a community that says, hey, this is what's going on. This is what you need to know about yourself. And then people actually taking a really honest look at themselves saying, you know what, I could do this or I can't do it. Or am I in, or am I going into this profession for the right reasons? Well, here, here's the thing. I hate when people say, uh, you know, maybe this job isn't for you. Maybe you should get another job. And, and, and the reason I hate that is because I don't think that any one of us knew exactly what we were getting into. I mean, we may have had a little bit of knowledge of what corrections was, but when that door or that gate shuts behind you for the first time and you're all alone swimming in the shark tank, uh, you, you didn't know. You didn't know. You, the first time you wrestle a shit-covered uh, inmate or client, you didn't know. You didn't know what you were getting into, right? And, and, and I, I think it's so, so dismissive because I feel like we're losing good officers who, if we would have just taken the time to say, hey, I know that what you saw upset you, or I know that it was traumatic, or I know that you feel like you've made a mistake or something, but let me share my experience. Let me talk you through this, coach you through this. I think we could salvage some of those staff members. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that we've lost the incentive. I don't even know if we even had the incentive, really, to maintain or invite people into this profession. Um that that's scary because the thing is you want to have the right professional to work this job, which means that you have to create the right incentives, you know, and yes, it's pay. We're worth it. Yes, it's benefits. Um, but you want that high level person because you're dealing with a job that really isn't just for anyone. I mean, this job right. will test you every day and you got to have that right mindset. But I also want to tell you something too. a lot of people don't may not realize this, too, but. People look at us as Neanderthals and people don't realize that we also change a lot of lives behind that wall. To a lot of people, we're actually role models. You know, I, I'm telling you, I know that for a fact. I mean, I've even had inmates come up and say, hey, Gange, you know what? Um, you know, I, I respect you, you know, Gange. Um, you know, you know, this was a job that I thought I could have. And then you wind up talking and say, well, you know what, man, there's other things that you can do. You have these interactions. And, and I'll tell you something else. Again, just to paint a positive light on our COs, people that think that our COs are you know, very primitive. First of all, they're not. They're very intelligent. People, again, just the way the public has painted us for so long. Right. I remember talking to an officer recently. She had just retired. And I asked her, I said, hey, you know, since you're done, what do you think was the biggest impact that you had? You know, and it's, a, it's just to show you how people get us wrong is the greatest impact, the impact that she could remember was an impact she had with a young kid who, you know, had just entered the prison system that actually listened to her and never came back. That's a story that she took with her on the last day of her retirement because in her mind, oh, she was a great officer, by the way, phenomenal officer, but she was able to find her why. She was right. able to find, and, and guys, just, if you guys are out there right now, I, I read a lot and there's a lot of business theories that are out there that unfortunately, some of the theories out there, no one really tries to apply it to correction, so that's what we try to do. There's a thing about the internal why. The internal why is what motivates us to stay in a profession amongst the negativity. So, like, if you're in it for any other reasons but that internal why, well, then you wind up, you know, when your foundation gets shaken a little bit, you wind up looking for a way out. If you have the right internal why, if you know exactly why you're in this profession and that why motivates you, it doesn't matter how rocky the times get. You'll survive the hardest in this profession because you found a reason to do what you do that goes beyond the external incentive. It's something that you've internalized. And if I just may say to everybody here, you're worth in this profession because the profession itself is crucial to the survival of our communities. You know, so you're worth 
should be your internal why. Because what you're doing, most people can't do. So find that internal why and let that motivate you during the times of struggle, including right now, the coronavirus. My buddy Jim here says it's especially true. Even in small jails, you can have a huge impact. And I, I'll tell you what, Anthony, I've, I've had so many interactions throughout my career with, with inmates and officers where I said, you know what, this is why I was here today. I remember I had a kid, man, and I, I do my I do my, my initial walkthrough and I shoot the shit with them and kind of gauge the temperature of the of the night and, and see what was going on. And, and this kid just looked a little troubled. And I said... I said, hey, man, if you ever need anything, you just come up, come up and talk to me, you know. And I, I say that 100 times a day, and sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't talk to cops. But I'm sitting up there, and this kid comes up, and I asked him. I said, hey, man, I said, uh, I said, what's up? He said, you said I could talk to you. And I said, yeah, what's on your mind? He said, my sister just committed suicide today, killed herself. And uh, I said, oh, you know, I, I snapped right into, okay, this is not just asking for something terrible. This is, you know, this is, let's talk here. And. And uh, he went on to tell me that he was really close with his sister and that the mom called. And then he told me about a suicide attempt that he had done uh, when he was younger. And that the only uh, reason that he didn't complete it is because his sister was there. His sister mm. talked him out of it. And so after that point, his sister was always his reason to stay alive. Well, now his only reason had just succumbed to suicide. and. And uh, so I asked him, I said, well, so I asked him about how he tried. And, and I said, how do you feel? Do you feel like you felt, you know, back then? Are you at that place, you know? And he said, uh, he said, what do you mean, free? And I just floored me because he was like, no worries. I know what I need to do. I know what I want to do. And so I said, look, man, I got to act on this. Here's what's going to happen. I put him through the, the protocol. And I saw that kid, you know, I... I after he left, I got him returned back to secure custody. I thought, well, maybe, maybe he wasn't going to do anything. Maybe there was nothing, you know, whatever. We always, we always kind of second guess ourselves. But I saw that guy three months ago, and uh, and he told me that he was going to kill himself that night. And he told me that because I talked to him, that he didn't do it. And now he was going to get out. He was on his way out. He's going to go with his mom to visit his sister's grave in California. And I just thought, man, if I wasn't if I wasn't there that night, or if I hadn't chosen this profession, maybe that kid would have been dead. Maybe not, but I, I don't know. And and there's several interactions I have, you know, throughout my career like that. And not they're not always that crazy, but uh, just a conversation with a fellow officer. You know, hey, what's on your mind? And they tell you. I mean, it. it there's a reason we're all where we're at, you know? Well, it's our community. You know, guys, I'll, I'll share a positive interaction uh, that I had. And the reason why it's good to share this is because most people paint a negative picture. They paint an us versus them mentality. Uh, I don't agree uh, that we do have an us versus them mentality. And I'll tell you why. And if we do, I'll tell you why we can't have that us versus them mentality. If you guys want to hear uh, my story of an interaction where I felt my worth um, by dealing with a, uh, an inmate, I'll, I'll share. Just say Please yes, do. and I'll, Please I'll do. tell you the quick story. Please do. Uh, yeah, well, I'll see if I get a couple of yeses. Oh, okay. Uh, but, but the us first them mentality, you know, I, I don't promote that, by the way, because I'll tell you why. As I started moving up in this profession, you start seeing the bigger picture, right? Right. So as a correctional officer, what I tended to do was I was always looking to the left and right to see, you know, what this job's about. So, yes, I would look at the you know, you know what my job is, like how to run a unit, how to be whatever it was. But I also was curious about how other people, you know, interacted. You know, what was the social service department about? What, what were they doing? And what was you know, the program running in my unit? You know, I was very curious about, you know, the other departments. Then as I became a sergeant, I started interacting with the other departments. And I really started seeing a worth in what they do and a great partnership with what we do. Yes, there's got to be a partnership. And at all times, I felt that, you know, the rehabilitative side had respect for the custody side. Because at all times, believe it or not, the rehabilitation sides know who we are. They know what we do. They come into this environment relying on us. So they know what we do and who we are. We sometimes don't know what they do and how important their role is. I really got to see it when I moved up to the administrative level 
And then as I moved up, I, I started seeing the importance of that work because as I moved up, they said, Ganji, what's your background? Custody, okay, you're in charge of all the programming, which gave me a value for them, but it was a balanced perspective. I saw this perfect dance, and to me it was wonderful because I happened to work in a system where, you know, yeah, there's some back and forth, but for the most part, there's a respect for each other, and when you have that respect, you have that communication, magic happens. It really does. Magic just, it just happens. So... With that said, you know, the us first them mentality, I real this is what I realized. I realized that if we walk into work with this us first them mentality, with let's say custody versus inmates, we wind up actually having an us first them mentality with the civilians who we think advocate for them without understanding what their right. job is. Right. And for me on the administrative level, that that doesn't work because I noticed something from an initiative called One Voice that's out in uh, Michigan. They've been on my show multiple times. Do you guys know how powerful the voice of corrections is when we start having those civilians back us? I mean, a lot, a lot of civilians will step up and say, yo, I couldn't do your job. I know how dangerous it is. These are people that you want on your side. So when we have change and we have to go up and speak about what's needed, they'll come and say, yo, you got to listen to them. I know you want to implement this program, but you got to hear the operational side and you know how we have to make this work. So they could be advocates for us but we have to be willing to allow them into our world. That's the key. And that us first them mentality, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a good fit for us. Now, did we get, I don't know if we got any yeses. If you got like wants six, to hear. you got like six or seven yeses, Anthony. Go ahead. All man. right, so I, I, I'm sorry. If I get eight or nine yeses, I'll share the story. So if I get two more yeses, I'll I'll share the story of where I found my 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 work. So if you have to say another yes again and repeat it, we'll, We'll count that as a, All right. well, as a yes. While we're waiting for the yeses, uh, I, I had the, uh, the pleasure of watching your inmate manipulation course. Can you, first of all, uh, after, uh, you know, I've got, I just uh, started my 16th calendar, 16 years in corrections, and, and during that course, you, I mean, there were things that I never thought of um, when, you, uh, when you went through that. So talk a little bit about the course, how they can get involved with that, and, and then, and then, maybe a couple of points of of the uh the inmate manipulation man because i'll tell you what that's it's like i said after 15 years in the game uh that that's some new stuff okay so i do got a lot of yeses coming in so oh, there's a ton of yeses okay no, go so ahead. What, what, what should i uh, you you run the show i'm used to hosting so should i do the manipulation should i do the story first yeah let's do the story first and I want to do the manipulation. By the way, guys, a little side thing. I do have that manipulation course available. If you go to any one of my latest YouTube videos, you'll see a link. But let me let me let me explain the story first. So when I when I entered this profession, I started my career at a female facility. Correct. So a lot of my in I had a lot of interactions at the female facility because they're a little bit more opened up with communication, a little bit more dialogue. So you wind up learning a lot. And at the very beginning, I didn't know what my goals were in this profession. I was just going to explore it as it comes, right? But I really did, I'm the kind of person that wants to have an impact, right? So what, what guys don't realize is in corrections, you wind up having a lot of forced interactions. What I mean by that is you communicate with people that you wouldn't normally communicate with. And as long as you keep things professional, you get an understanding of a, of a very unique perspective that we may not be you know, prone to, because again, we're on the outside looking in. So I remember there was this one female inmate and, um, you know, straight from the streets, you know, living the gang life. She was a brim. She was a blood. Father was a blood. That's all she knew. Right. So when she came into the system, I remember in the first couple of weeks, she had to have an image of being tough and, you know, playing the route. And I didn't know her from a hole in the wall, by the way, at this point. I was new to the career as well. And then when she got out of our reception area and she went into a uh, regular housing area, she made her mark by just kind of entering that unit and taking out a few of the uh, female inmates that were there, right? Now, I was one of the people that had responded to it. Now, guys, I don't usually share personal stories, but I think this story has a lot of value to it. So, it, you know, I don't know if the job's going to look bad at it, but there's nothing negative being said here, I promise you. So I remember escorting the, the female inmate, you know, from the, the housing location first to the infirmary to get them checked and then obviously to a holding area uh, while they wait out their charges. So this inmate really didn't say much the whole time, you know, just, you know, holding on to this tough image, whatever it was. And then, you know, in the infirmary, same thing, holding on to this tough image. 
and then taking the inmate to lock, holding on to this tough image, right? And this female, she could throw down. You know, this this wasn't a girl that wasn't tough. I mean, she was tough, but this was all she knew. Right. So that night, I happened to be working overnight, right? So I had to break the detention area where we would hold the inmates uh, that were pending charges before they were sent out to another facility. So I remember doing my tour, and I hear this um, female, she's crying in the cell, right? So my first thing think is I, 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 I kind of walk by the cells, you know, and then when I start to go back to my desk, there's still me. I'm still Ganja. I'm, I'm still, you know, I wear the uniform. The uniform doesn't wear me. So I was motivated to see what was going on. So I went back and I peeked into the cell and I saw the female inmate. She's crying in the back end of the cell. And I remember her from earlier that day. And whether she heard me or not, I didn't know. But I said, you know, you should allow what you feel right now. You should allow it to come out because this tells you that you're better than this place. The moment that you're okay with being here, the moment that you don't feel vulnerable, you don't feel upset, is the moment that you've accepted this place as your home. So it's okay to show this vulnerability. Don't think it's a sign of weakness. And that's all I said. It, 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 I mean, literally, that was it. It was like less than 40 seconds, right? So... A few months had passed because the, the inmate was found guilty of doing the assault and I believe had to serve like 180 days in what you would call restrictive housing and then wind up coming back to our, our facility. And I remember standing in the mess hall and um, as, I'm inter- as I'm interacting with the lieutenant, I, I had to say something over the uh, loudspeaker. I think some of the females had, were wearing hats and I never had to tell them they had to take off their hats. And I remember this girl, she stood up. Now mind you, six months later, she stood up and I'm watching her. You know, in corrections, we could read mouth just right. like they could. And I said, I believe she's saying my name. And the lieutenant goes, well, I said, who's that? Who's that girl? Mind you, I only had the one interaction prior. I said, who, what's that to make things? I believe she's saying my name, like, like, like Ganji, like, like she, like she knows me. So as she's walking out, she gets behind the wall. Like, so she's to the side. And as I step out, she goes, officer Ganji, can I talk to you? I said, like, Hey, what were you saying? In there? I said, I heard you reading. I heard you saying my name or I read your lips saying my name. And she goes, I don't know if you remember me, but I got into a fight about six months back and you were the one that gave me this advice. And that advice, that advice held true to me. No one ever gave me advice like that before. I was thinking I had to be this certain way. And she goes, I felt that you gave me, you gave me a level of expectation. And I said, I did. And I expect you to reach that expectation because this, you're young. This is one chance, you know? So what I did was I gave this person now, because now she's becoming a person to me. Because again, you have the inmate aspect when she's, you know, acting a little wacky, but people do make changes, right? So as she's making changes, I gave her this level of expectation. And the sad thing is, is that when she would make bad choices, she would actually apologize to me because she felt that I could, that I expected more from her and she failed to meet the expectation. And of course, I'd always tell her, it's about, you know, it's for you. The expectation is for you. And we're going to have failures. We're going to have setbacks, but the key is, is that you know where your destination is. You know where you have to be. If you know where you have to be in life, you can never be lost. That's the key. So with that said, about three or four four years of just kind of going back and forth because she didn't make bad choices, but she knew they were bad choices. That was the difference at this point. One of the officers had called me to the unit. They said, Gans, can you stop by the unit? So I stopped by the unit and it was, it was the, uh, the inmate, the, or her last day, the inmate's last day. And she said, I just want to tell you something, Gan. She goes, no one ever took time like you did to speak to me, you know, at the level that you did, to see me as someone that can do more than the circumstances I'm at. And to this day, now this is going back to probably uh, maybe 10 years ago, she's never been back in the system since. So mind you, she was young coming in, 18, 19 years old. You know, so she never came back. And I, and that, that to me was, that, that stayed with me. That's probably the one person's name I remember of all my interactions but then when I moved up as a sergeant my interactions now are more focused on my officers more focused on my staff and now as I'm an administrative level you know they everybody kind of deals with the inmates I kind of work with my front line and kind of work with you know my supervisors because that's where my my attention is now so if that makes any sense I hope that was a a decent story no, great, uh, but I'll let you guys story. tell me it's a great and now story. what was your what was the oh the manipulation course okay so Okay, so check this out. I'm going to tell you guys a quick little story. Did a video on this as well. 
when I was in the academy, the manipulation that was taught was pretty much focused on the outcome. Don't bring shit in, right? What they didn't focus on was the process. The process is what the invisible threat is because the process is something that you don't see. So when I was going back to school and getting my degree, I took social psychology and social psychology had a lot of courses of on basically what motivates us without knowing that we're being motivated to do something, right? So let me, let me rewind a little bit. Let me give you a brief story. I don't know if you guys watch my channel, um, but the first day of the, the first day when I was, when I was uh, on the job, I was given a housing unit, right? And I'm going to tell you why this manipulation became my goal uh, throughout this profession. And basically, in, in short, the, the manipulation course that I've done is based on social psych theories. It's, it's what motivates us without realizing we're doing it. So there's, it's a very complex course. It's not like a simple 101. But let me give you a brief story to kind of let you understand a little bit of what this course is about. And I, I think we can relate to this. I talked about the process, but let me let me give you one scenario uh, of many that, that's actually in this course. But okay, so when I first started this job, right, I was very lucky, okay? When I worked at the female facility within the first days, I, I felt supported by my peers. I did, I, I did. And I felt supported by the few supervisors that would interact in my unit. So of course, when you're a rookie, a lot of the inmates are gonna come up and, you know, kind of ask you, uh, hey, how can I help you? You know, they're, they're going to try to work their angles. But I never really felt the need to have them because I, I didn't have a problem calling my peers who were ever welcoming. You know, they were always welcoming to me. That's why I don't believe in that sink or swim mentality. Uh, because at the time, you know, we're vulnerable as rookies. All we know is policy. And we, we really don't have discretion at that point, you know. So everything's pretty much by the book. And if you work in corrections, not everything's by the book. So, but I had good resources. So everything's good. I'm on a high. I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. The, the day is going well. And I'm really feeling good about this profession on the first day of the job. So what happens is towards the end of the day, and again, I'm, I'm really running things on policy, but getting the support that I need. An inmate had come up during the last count and said that she had felt threatened by another inmate. So the rule of thumb is when an inmate feels threatened by another inmate, what you should do is you need to call the supervisor immediately and also separate that inmate from the other inmate and just try to figure out what's going on, which is what I did. The inmate that said she felt threatened, I put the inmate in the public area and I called for a supervisor to come to the unit to help me, you know, deal with the situation. Now, by the way, it was about five to 10. So the shift was coming to an end. So most likely the the supervisor was probably in their car getting ready to go home when I called for the supervisor. I could actually picture the supervisor banging his fucking knuckles on the steering wheel, probably by, you know, uh, Officer Gandhi, the sergeant, such and such. So when the supervisor came in and I was by the desk, I was a, a pretty good distance away from the supervisor. And by the way, this was an open dorm. I had the inmate out in the public area and these were wings on the side. Uh, this sergeant just started reaming at me. I mean, really yelling at me to the point where it was embarrassing. I, I tried to bring myself closer to see if he would lower himself, like, you know, lower his voice because I was by the desk and this sergeant started yelling at me right from the, right from the door. So I said, well, let me get up and let me move closer maybe, but it didn't matter. So basically, you know, he just belittled me, uh, you know, basically, you know, you damn rookies, you don't know what the hell you're doing, you know, and just bastardized me. Now, mind you guys, I was on a high, so I fell hard. I mean, I was having this great day and I fucking went from here all the way down to the bottom. So with that said, uh, he just pretty much tells me when the other officer comes in to relieve me, you'll get the fuck out. I guess I'll have to handle your work and I'm leaving the unit. You know, again, I came in with my head held high. Now my head is down and I still have no idea what the hell I did wrong. Uh, I'm just not being able to piece it together. And the next day when I find out, you know, OK, where do I got to work? I got to work in the same unit that I was just, you know, embarrassed in. So I remember going to work. My fucking stomach is killing me. This was not like my first day where I was excited and energy. This was a different type of nervousness. So as I'm walking up to the unit, I even remember thinking, you know, maybe I should call my field training officer about what happened. Or maybe I should just man up and take it. I don't know. This was not constructive in any way right. at all. So as soon as I went into the unit, I'm vulnerable, by the way, guys. You got to realize that I was just yelled at. I was just belittled. So as soon as I walked into the unit, all these inmates started coming up to me and they were like, yo, what that sergeant did was wrong. He shouldn't embarrass you like that. And you were only trying to do your job. And you guys got to realize something. I was belittled and I was embarrassed in front of them. So there was a need for me 
to regain my sense of pride. And these inmates knew that. And the thing is, is if you're embarrassed in front of somebody, you want to get your pride back by, you know, interacting with that person that you're embarrassed in front of and just kind of, you know, hey, at least you see what I'm saying. And, and you feel the need to vent back. So what happened was I was almost falling for this, believe it or not. I was almost falling for this game until the inmate had said, you know, she went from the sergeant being like an ass to us, correctional officers, a very generalized, we're all asses. And I said, well, that wasn't my perspective. Remember, guys, it was only that one supervisor. The other officers were great. The few supervisors that came in were great. So that was a wake-up call for me to say, you know what, this is none of your business, actually, because that's not what I felt. And that was enough for me to wake up. Now, mind you, if I did not check that in myself, if I didn't realize like, hey, like something doesn't feel right, if I didn't notice that, if something would have happened six months down the line, I'm not minimizing my actions. If I would have done something foolish, I'm not minimizing that. It's still on me. I'm still taking responsibility. But nobody would have let, you know, look back six months to realize that was when I became vulnerable. I became vulnerable because this supervisor decided to yell at me in the unit and then there was a need for me to save face. Now, right. mind you, this was an experienced supervisor, Will. Now, let me tell you how, why I also continue to be motivated on manipulation. Because sometimes we don't realize what we do, how it affects others. In manipulation, it's, it's, it's basically how we react to novel situations that we're in. Especially if it's ambiguous situations, you look to other people that are around you to give you guidance. Especially if these are people that you respect. So with that said, when this supervisor was getting ready to retire, we had a last interaction. And basically, I had mentioned to the supervisor, I said, hey, I don't know if you remember this, but I do. On, on day one of my job, this is what happened in the story I just mentioned. And this is how it affected me. By the way, the sergeant did not remember this. And the sergeant, his response was, I can't believe you're holding on to this shit for that long. So the scary thing is, is that they don't realize what that could have done. So I wind up holding on to this and I wind up saying, you know what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take note of every time I feel motivated to do something that breaks away from who I want to be behind this wall, which was a great survival for me. So if I felt motivated to say yes, when I should say no, don't get me wrong, I'm still going to say no, but I'm going to go back and ask myself, why did I want to say yes? And I developed a course on that, which is pretty much based on social psych theories, based on why down in the duck works. We all know what down in the duck is, but do we know why it works? And just an overall understanding of how we can get manipulated on a level that we may not realize we're being manipulated on. And that course is available through Academy Hour. And if you go to my YouTube channel, if you guys haven't, please subscribe. The link to that course is there. And uh, that course is an eye opener, I, I believe so, because it's the story of my career for the last 18 years. Yeah, no, so me, that's my manipulation thing. For me, the other day, uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, we had a guy, uh, an inmate, and he always used the word, those criminals. He was talking about those criminals, those criminals. And, and I remembered your course and watching your course, and I thought, you know what, I really feel like this guy is trying to align himself with me and distance himself from the inmate population by using, I mean, it's like every time he used that word, and I don't even use that word, I don't even say criminal, criminal, but he was always like, yeah, those criminals back there, or those guys are just criminals, and I really felt like he was trying to, to, to get closer to me, and I, you know, I shut him down right away, and that's, you know, I, I probably would have done that eventually anyways, but because of your course, and because of that information, and kind of that perspective, and you talk about that story that you just told on that course, I, I mean, I just, I recognize it just like that, you know, so it's, yeah, you it's know, helpful. You, you know, that that's actually a great, you know, there's another thing we mentioned in the course real quick that mattered to me where you have officers that an inmate will ask them something personal and instead of them, instead of them telling them it's none of the inmates business, they kind of lie and say, well, how many kids you got? Oh, I got nine kids or what car you drive? I drive a red car vet. You know, sometimes these inmates ask questions, they already know the answers and you wind up just being seen as inconsistent. And then I remember telling the one officer who used to do this all the time, I said, why can't you just tell the inmate no? Like, it's none of their business. And he, I said, I know you, you think these jokes are funny, but are you only saying these jokes because you cannot tell the inmate no? No is a very hard thing to do. You got to realize something, guys. Inmates try to manipulate 
the why, how you justify your no. So if your no is a weak no, and what I mean by a weak no is if it's an externalized no, like it's no because the sergeant says no. That's a weak no. Right. The no should be, I said no. You know, there's a scenario. I used to teach identifying deceptive behavior um, with a gentleman named Dale Sollers. And there was a story we talked about where there was an officer that was given a love note from an inmate, right? And basically the love note... Um, the officer did the right thing, you know, really turned in the love note, whatever it was. And the inmate, like, why'd you turn it in? So how she responded to this question, which I'll tell you, is very important. But the inmate wanted to know the justification because, guys, the no itself is hard to manipulate. It's how we justify the no that opens up the game for manipulation. So now, to be honest with you, I could really give two shits. If you, if you say no, you really don't have to justify it. But if there's an urge to... You have to remember the justifying has to be internal. So in this case here, when she said, when he said, why did you turn it in? She goes, because it's the rules. It's the regulations. You know that. So the inmate goes back down the wing and says, well, if it wasn't for the rules and regulations, we could be together. Hmm. That's an external no. That's a weak no. What she should have said is no. Why? Because I said it's no. Right. Because I said it's unprofessional. Because I said it's unacceptable. And, you know, it, it matters because, again, if your no is weak, and I found out that sometimes the people that joke, the people that are given, that are asked these personal questions that wind up kind of like answering them, but they, they answer them in a foolish manner. When you go back up and say, why couldn't you just tell the inmate no, it's none of their business, they'll come back and say, you know what, Ganji, that's why I think I joke about it. Because the no is actually pretty hard to say. No, you're right. And, and, and uh, I... I get, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to think, I've got all these scenarios running through my head and I, I'm trying to combine your, your sergeant story where how he kind of, you know, made you look foolish in front of him and then that kind of undermines you and then you're, you're trying to, to say no and you're trying to do these things and do the things right and, and it, this manipulation happens and, and can happen easier when you're left alone and if you feel isolated from other staff, which is when officers talk to you crazy or when a supervisor treats you bad, they put you on this island, man. They make you they make you vulnerable. And even if you think about it, we are alone, you know, direct supervision or, or indirect, however you are. But you spend most of your days surrounded by inmates, right? And, and staff, some days you, you hardly see any. And so if you have any kind of uh, flaw or if you have any kind of insecurity or, or like you said, trouble, and, and you're on this island, man, they, they just groom you over the course of, of days and months and years to, to, to get you to do something that you shouldn't do. Hey, Jim made a good comment, too. In small rural jails, those questions are common knowledge. We know a lot of the inmates on the outside as friends. Yeah, I know jails may be a little bit different, but as I said, it's still, the, the basically the story is being able to say the no, but um, I, I, I agree with you 100%, Jim. Jails are tough because you do have people that, unfortunately, are going to be from your same communities and same towns. But, again, you know, you have to be able to step up and say no. And I, one of the things we mentioned in the manipulation course, since we'll just dig in it one more time, is you're 100% correct. In order for manipulation to occur, and, guys, this is just pretty much catch-all advice here, is that the inmate needs to pull you out of your prescribed role. That means they, could, they need to connect with you on something personal, and they need to isolate you from your peers. They need to get you on that island, and they do that sometimes without you realizing it. Look for the body language. You know, sometimes you'll be chatting with an inmate, which, you know, not realizing that the inmate's body language, when an officer comes in, they look at that and they say, yo, what's up with that? But here's the sad thing, though, guys. Sometimes we don't police each other either. I hate it when someone gets caught up while sitting back like, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Yeah, but if you knew that was going to happen, why didn't nobody act on it? Right. Well, Ganji, at the time, see, here's the key, guys. The process is a feeling, which means that that's what my course is technically about, guys. So I'll give it away. I don't care. You know, the feeling. So a lot of us don't, we don't tend to, because we can't actually see it, the setup process, I mean, we don't actually stop it because we're concerned if we're wrong. Like, hey, Ganji, what about if I'm wrong and this person gets offended by it? What about if you're right? And if your brothers and sisters, they shouldn't get offended by it. Hey, listen, this doesn't look right. I just wanted to tell you that. It's not judge. But if you guys wait too long, what's going to happen is that person starts to accept that behavior as their own. 
then it becomes harder to change their perspective. You have to get it right at the get-go. The moment you feel something, go up to that officer and say, hey, can I talk to you a little bit in a private manner? Hey, listen, I think you're being played a little bit. This is what I got. But the process, and the last thing I ever want to hear is, well, we knew this was going to happen. Well, now I'm going to start looking at you saying, well, if you knew, what were the signs and why didn't you do something about it? Right. Hey, Anthony, Eric Mack has a question. He's, he's, starting, uh, he's starting his correctional career on Monday. And he wants to know if he, if you have any recommendations for a new boot like myself starting on the line in Monday. All right, so I'll go first. I'm so used to doing uh, hosting my own show. I'm getting ready to. I was getting ready to forward you it too. Uh, okay, so so uh, first off, welcome welcome to the family. Uh, we'd love to have you. And I, I, obviously, I will tell you something. The fact that you're asking that question means a lot to us because there's a lot of people that come in not thinking they need they they, they need it. They think they know everything. So the fact that you're humble enough that ask a question means a lot. So first off, let me give the simplistic advice first, which is the age old, age old device of being firm, fair, and consistent, right? We all agree with that, right? Uh, I don't have to reiterate that. I'm sure in the comments here, we have a lot of professionals that can tell us what firm, fair, and consistent means to them. Right. Uh, because obviously people have a way of interpreting it, but being firm, fair, and consistent is definitely key. Also know yourself. Know who you are before you put on that uniform. Uh, the reason why, guys, and this is just my, my, my advice here, is that the uniform protects us, yes, to some level, but we know who we are when we have to go through a situation that may be novel to us. So all because we, we wear that uniform doesn't mean that we all of a sudden become immune to the real emotions that define who we are uh, in the outside world, especially your family. They're going to know who you are, you know. Hey, you, you, you may wear a uniform at work, but your family sees you when you take it off. So there are going to be certain things that you're going to see that may have an effect on you. And you have to be honest with that. You have to be honest with how that affects you. Please be honest, because if you're not honest with that, you're going to bottle that all in. And when you bottle it all in, eventually you're going to snap and you're going to wind up snapping at the people that love you the most, you know, because that's where unfortunately you you may be the most vulnerable and the, the sad thing is guys if you don't realize these changes are happening if you don't really have a true sense of self before you enter this profession then you're not going to understand those small changes that you're going through and your family's not going to be able to help you because they're not going to know you anymore you know so there's a good level of communication that you need to have with your family to keep you balanced to remind you of who you are before you enter this profession please also another thing is Inmates are conditioned to the uniform. So what I mean by that is if you get pulled over by the police, a lot of us, we don't deal with police every day. So that uniform carries a lot of weight. The lights carry a lot of weight. You know, that initial impression carries a lot of weight. But in, um, in corrections, not so much. Because in corrections, you have inmates that have been in and out of the system. The uniform really doesn't mean much to them. They're not going to be, oh, shit, here comes the... No, it, it's you. It's who you are. And the best way to be consistent in this profession is to know who you are and be that person throughout. If you can be that person throughout this profession, you will survive. You will make it both mentally and physically. And the inmates and your peers will respect that because they'll see that level of consistency. Believe it or not, guys, consistency, even if it's a consistent no, brings about respect. Consistency brings about respect. One other thing, too. When you're coming in fresh from the academy, and like the gentleman mentioned, it's great to ask questions. Balance balance what you learn from the academy, which is the books. Don't negate it. Don't minimize it. Try to balance that with the experience of the other professionals that you'll be working next to who can show you how that stuff can be applied. That's the real world knowledge. That's the magic. If you could take what's being taught in the academy and then partner with someone with experience who could teach you how that applies in the real world, that's what's going to make you an excellent officer. But you have to be partnered with somebody who wants to teach you. That's the magic. If you have somebody with experience that wants to teach you and you're willing to learn, we mentioned this at the beginning, it's a beautiful dance. You will learn so much. And also, at the very beginning, simple one-on-one advice, say no to everything because inmates are asking you questions they already know the answers right. to. Trust me. And the stuff that they're allowed to do, they're not going to ask you questions. That shit's automatic for them. So, you know, go ahead, give the nose, 
And eventually, guys, you will develop discretion. And your supervisors should be expecting write-ups your first couple of days because they know you're going to be tested. So they should be expecting you guys to write inmates up because, hello, I'm expecting to get tested throughout the day. But with that said, eventually you'll be able to develop some discretion. And then, you know, the yeses and the noes don't always have to be on the extreme, you know, ends of a spectrum. There's the middle road. But guys, that middle road takes a while. So anytime you're in an ambiguous situation, just say no. You can't go wrong with saying no. And if it's wrong, it's okay. You don't have to admit you're wrong. You could just go back in and say, you know what, after further review, we could change that. And your supervisor or your peer should allow that. So if I make a mistake, you you know, you go to your peers or you go to your sergeant, and sergeant goes, you know what, Gange, that could have been a yes, not a problem. Gange, go ahead, fix that. Do what you got to do. You don't need me to change that. That will help you give that level of authority. And also, one more thing, and, and I'm sure, uh, the perception of authority. Hey, guys, let me, let me tell you a little something here, too, and I did a video on this. We have the perception of authority, which means at any time that authority can be taken away from us. Again, we don't have the power of the uniform. So with that said, how the perception of authority gets supported is by supervisors that don't let inmates go around you. They'll support your perception of authority by if an inmate tries to circumvent you, they go ahead and send that inmate right back to you. So remember that perception of authority is big and do whatever you can to hold on to that perception of authority that you have. Right. I'm, I, I think I covered a lot. So tell me if you think that's good advice, guys. You guys are seniors, but feel free to compliment on some of that as well. We kind of work together on this. Ke Kelly says it takes a period of time to build your reputation and one second to lose it. You must be consistent. And I think that's oh, great right. I, I, think, I think people, when they hear that fair, firm, and consistent, I think they, they look at veteran staff and they say, well, you know, Officer Young does it this way, but I don't feel like I can do it that way because I have a different skill set. That's not what consistent means. Consistent means be yourself, be the same person every day, enforce the policies and, and, and don't change. Don't come in one day being an asshole and the next day you don't care about anything. I mean, because after about, really my experience, it's about six months, six to eight months, you travel around the facility, the inmates get to know you and they stop asking you those questions because they know how you're going to be. And, and and for me, that's that, that's what it is. So Eric, good, yeah, you, good luck. Man. I want to compliment something on that, Will, because you're 100% correct. Guys, listen to me. Just as much as the inmates are going to know you, another advice for the um, uh, the person you sent in the field, if you get housing units, if you become uh, consistent with your posts, I don't know how your facility works, know your inmates as well, as best you can. You know, um, especially the inmates that you're going to interact with daily. And also, if you're, in a, if you're in a position to train somebody, train them. I'm talking about for the senior officers here. Don't do what some people have done before where... And this has happened, guys, where you have a new boot and you leave the new boot alone and say, if you have any questions, this inmate's been in the unit for many years, they can help you. We know that happens. And I'll tell you something right now, that is the most disrespectful thing that you could ever do. Why the hell do I have to go to an inmate when I have professionals all around me? Just tell me that you're lazy and you don't want to help me. Right. Because that's the key. You know, if, if, if I need help, how dare you tell me to go to that inmate when you should say, hey, if you need help, I'll be that landline. You know, there's no there's no room for sink and swim in this profession, because at the end of the day, if that rookie sinks, the whole facility could be compromised. Well, I think they do that because somebody did that to them. And because you talked about a little bit how you need to, you know, kind of talk to the to people about things that are bothering you and stuff like that. I think that we because we internalize so much stuff. And we get so, uh, you know, institutionalized and, and, and we're pissed off all the time that that we say, well, we had to we had to figure it out. They should have to figure it out. I mean, that's the exact opposite of how we should be treating somebody who we may depend on to save our lives at some point. Right. Right. And you know what? And, and I like what Kelly said, too. If you're a trainer, you better be your best every day and a compliment what she says. Yes. And love to train. You know what? Rookies right. are vulnerable at the beginning of their career, obviously. Uh, and you want to show them support right from the get-go so they're not afraid to go to you. Because I'm going to tell you something. If they're afraid to go to you and you, they're stuck in a situation where they're desperate for an answer, and for some reason they're afraid to go to staff because you set this persona up where, you know, you want them to sink and you're avoiding them, well, guess what's going to happen, guys? They're not going to go to you because they're afraid, and out of desperation, 
they're going to turn to the population. Do not allow that to happen. Do not allow that to happen. Show them you're supportive right from the get-go. If they have questions, show them you're willing to answer it. Just do whatever you can to help them. Because if you don't do that to help them, what's going to wind up happening is that rookie who came in with good intent, this wasn't a rookie that wanted to be dirty. This was a rookie that came in with good intent to do the right thing, but we abandoned that individual. And we led that individual to the wolves. And then if that individual you know, becomes dirty, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to minimize what they've done, but we're a part of that because we didn't give that rookie a window for him to go to when they were lost. I, I 100% agree. And, you know, I flip through several of the correctional officer groups that I that I belong to, and I read the comments, and some of the comments that these people leave are just, they're just disgusting. I mean, they're, yes. get a different job, oh, maybe you're weak, or, I mean, it's, it's I mean, they're vicious, and I can't, it's exactly what you're talking about. I mean, what if an officer is reaching out for help and and his peers are telling him to go fuck himself. I mean, they just it, it, it's asinine to me that we treat each other so poorly uh, in those situations. So, it, you know, here's the thing. If 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 I see an officer get punched in the mouth, we react. We don't even hesitate. We go we go all hands on deck. We handle business. But if an officer comes to somebody and says, hey, man, this job's fucking me up a little bit or that thing that we saw the other day is messing me up a little bit. We we shut them. We tell them to, to suck it up. We tell them to may, maybe corrections isn't for them. I mean, that's just, I, I don't understand that. That's ridiculous. Yeah, you know what, guys? We, we do have a lot of individuals that are disenfranchised in this profession. Um, that's where I would kind of lean on the field training officer. Definitely, if you're a field training officer, you cannot be disenfranchised. You have to find the positive. You have to promote the positive. You have to motivate people to want to be in this profession. It's not about a need. It's about a want that partners with the need. So if you don't motivate people to want to be in this profession as a field training officer, the position is not for you. Field training's hard. It's not the easiest thing because you have to find the positive and the negative to keep people in this profession. It's easy to bitch all day. Right. What's hard to do is find, some, find something good to get someone to turn the negative into a positive. Now, with that said, I also expect this from the field training officer. Partner the people that you're training with people who want to train, people that are not miserable. But if by chance you have someone that is miserable and they're treating your rookies like shit, then you got to defend your rookies. You got to go to that senior officer and you got to tell them, cut your shit. Because at the end of the day, all you're doing is pushing good people out. We need people to come in. And right now we can do what we can on this venue. We could promote a want, you know, in this community, we could promote a want, you know, but then when they step into the real world, if they're not embraced, and everything we've done becomes a lie. Everything we did becomes a lie. Because here I am talking about the best and how we support each other and how we love each other and how we'll do anything for each other. And then you get this person who's vulnerable, but they're good because they know that when they come into this real world, they're going to be embraced. They're going to be loved by their brothers and sisters. But then as soon as they come in, if that, if that first interaction is negative, if they happen to meet with an officer that's disenfranchised, that pushes them away, that's going to become their perspective on this profession and they're going to carry it with them for as long as they're in that career. And then they're going to go back on venues like this right now and say, Ganji, I loved your channel, but everything you've ever taught about your peers has been a lie. Right. And that's because of that one person who had that negative interaction at that point where that officer was vulnerable. And that pisses me off because we can move forward. It takes forever. But man, when you go backwards, it goes so quick. Well, yeah, it's it's like a, it's like a feeding frenzy. It's disgusting. It's like you know what it is, guys. And again, and again, just to just to get it out there, guys, we we got to be careful on how we embrace the people that are coming into this profession. Okay, we have to make sure that if they remember the people that are coming into the profession, the majority of them want to be in the special, especially for people that are researching and following the venues that we hide. There, I uh, have that's a want. They can easily lose that want through one negative interaction because they're vulnerable. They don't know how to deal with that negative interaction. Now, everything we've done is fruitless. Now, a person was motivated to be in this profession, a person that we should help grow into maturity. We wind up now saying, fuck you, you know, go, go, go sink. And that's unacceptable. And then we start losing people that could be great in this profession that could have an impact. 
And then we're sitting there wondering why we're understaffed. And listen, I'll tell you something right now, and maybe Will can compliment on this, is that we know for a fact the incentives to be in this profession are poor. We know that. But that's not what keeps us in this profession. What keeps us in this profession is that we're working next to good people. Trust and believe that's a big part of why we stay in this profession. At least it was for me. So if we're not getting the proper incentive from, incentive from the outside, the least we can do from the inside is embrace that individual. Show him love to find some way to balance that materialistic incentive until shit changes for us. But if we don't do that, then you can't expect good people to stay. And then you better not be on the other side saying, yeah, we're understaffed and all this other stuff. Yeah, but when we got people coming in, if you're not embracing them, if you're pushing them aside, we're going to remain understaffed. Hey, uh, uh, Robbie Chaos on here, who who I know personally, and uh, she makes uh, she brings to work every night uh, some banana bread, and she leaves it. So I don't know if she brings it just for me, uh, but it's fantastic banana bread. But she says, what advice... <laughs> She says, what advice do you have for experienced officers dealing with rookies who seem to have a sense of entitlement? Ah, uh, that's a good, uh, well, let me comment real quick on uh, Heather. She gave a good point. She goes, at FDR, I always had the mindset to give the new boots as much helpful info as possible. It was partially selfish just because I knew one day they just might be one coming through the door to save my ass. But, hey, right. you are right on point, uh, Heather. You are right on point. Okay, so. First off, here's the funny thing. So obviously we are dealing with rookies who may feel that the academy uh, – let me tell you something right now. Sometimes the academy is at fault at first because sometimes the academy, they get like these new ways of training and then they wind up bad-mouthing the older officers who haven't received that new training. Uh, I don't know if they really realize what they're doing, uh, but you know, you know, training is forever evolving. So there could be a good chance like the training I took, you know, 18, 19 years ago is going to be definitely a lot different than the training that you're getting now right. uh, in my state. The training you're getting now is more intense, more aggressive. And then what happens is sometimes you get these academies, uh, these uh, trainers in the academy that says, I'll tell you something. Some of those people that are, you know, working in the system now would never be able to survive what you guys are going through. And what they do is they wind up motivating these recruits to kind of feel that the academy uh because they feel it's a lot better it puts them at a level higher than you know the senior officers who are already in the profession now with that said what they're negating is the experience so i'll tell you something right now you could have a great academy but it's really the experience that makes you the officer that you need to be to survive in this profession, right? So what you need to do is you need to really humble these individuals with that level of experience. Hey, Will, you're not frozen, are you? No. Oh, uh, you were looking down for quite I, some time. I, I, I know the, you were I frozen. Re- no, I was reading the I was um, I was frozen by your intellect. Oh no, no, because I saw you looking down. I was wondering if you were frozen. Okay, <laughs> so basically what I mean by that, so first book it starts in the academy. The academy has to make sure that they let these new boots know that, okay, you're learning this stuff, but don't get me wrong, you still need that experience. Without experience, none of this stuff matters. We're going to give you a foundation, yes, but you have to still know how that foundation is going to be applied into the facility you're in. So there has to be a value with the experience. Now, for the, those that think they know it all, uh, and, and you try to motivate them, you try to get them to relate to you, eventually at one point, they're going to fail. And when they fail, your approach is going to matter. It doesn't have to be an I told you so approach. It could be still a constructive approach because eventually they're going to fail. Maybe that will humble them. Maybe they won't. But but here's the funny thing, guys. I think also some people coming in that don't do the research, they also believe that this profession is a lot more simplistic than it really is. They really believe you're a babysitter. You're, you know, a, a simple guard. They don't really understand the comp- complications of this profession. So the, the sad thing is, is when you get a rookie that thinks they know it all, what people don't realize is that rookie is going to not ask for help when they need it. Right. For me. And that's something. Yeah. And, and for me, that's something like I don't. I'm not going to wait for the I don't want to wait for an officer to fail 
uh, for me to kind of be there, even though it could happen. What I'm saying is that if, if the person fails and it happens, be constructive and pick them up. But you still don't want them to fail. So if you have officers that, you know, new boots coming in, not willing to take the help that you're going to provide, you still can't back away from giving them the help that they need. We're not in a position to say, okay, well, now you're on your own. You're still going to have to right. be in the shadows. And then eventually they'll see it. Eventually they'll make mistakes. And eventually you'll be there to fix it. And whether they want to take it in or not, that's on them. And, and I want to go on a side note with that too. You know what's funny about this profession, kind of again with the manipulation, is that we deal with also a lot of disenfranchised employees. And the sad thing is what these disenfranchised employees don't realize is some, people don't want to be around people that are negative. So they wind up putting themselves on an island that leaves them vulnerable to be manipulated because staff doesn't want to be around them because they're negative. So when you have a negative employee in corrections, you have to do the opposite. You can't avoid them. You have to embrace them. Because if you don't embrace them, they wind up staying on this island, but they're doing it to themselves. So same thing here. If you have this employee that thinks they're better than everyone else coming in, technically, it, it, you know, you would like to say, hey, learn and I'll watch you fail. And you want to kind of have I told you so. You can't have that in this profession. You have to literally be there regardless. And eventually you're hoping the person's going to turn around and say, you know what? I was wrong. And if they don't turn around, they're going to learn the hard way eventually because one day you're not going to be able to be there. But I guess the key is just still maintain the presence. Don't let that officer's ignorance push you away. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. I think that uh, for me, I try to say something and I think it's I think it's cute when a rookie thinks they know everything. I really do. I, because because you, you it's like watching a kid ride their bicycle for the first time without training wheels. You know that they're going to wobble and probably fall and skin their knee. And as long as you're there to help them, then that's fine. And I think a lot of officers, uh, because they're, they've got the weight of the world on their shoulder, and then they've got this new boot that's saying, well, I know how to do it already. And we're like, fine, fuck you, then figure it out. you know. But that, that's the opposite of what we need to do. We need to, like you said, we need to be positive. We need to, we need to help them out. So, uh, and I also said to keep the questions coming. Hey, guys, I'll tell you a little side note. So me, you know, we, we do the other venue, the um, uh, what's the show? Oh, tear talk. <laughs> you, forgot, um, you forgot your own. No, show? I'm a member. I'm OCD. I'm ADHD. I have everything. Obviously, right. uh, I hear, I only hear half your question. I guess the answer. I'm assuming <laughs> I'm okay. Uh, I don't think I, I've I asked you a know. question yet. Yeah, I, I, listen, I ramble. Uh, believe it or not, but you know what we're gonna do now? Actually, when we do tear talk in the future, is we have people that are coming on and they're gonna give us stories, kind of shoot their own thing, and then we're actually gonna play the different stories of like, oh, let's say you have an officer at your facility and they did something great. You want to share that. Send me the video and we'll share the story with everybody. Because again, the voice is for everyone. I think it's it's great to do that because I think that there's a lot that we can learn from each other, but we have to be willing to allow ourselves to step on, uh, you know, step, you know, out of the shadows. And we're also doing panels too, where if you have a question, we'll put you on our Zoom, uh, whatever, our, and you can ask the question for the panel and then we could all attack it. But if you have any other questions, let's keep the questions coming. I, lo I love questions. Uh, Don Don put on there that he had a an officer, a fellow officer at Stony Mountain Institution, uh, had his throat slashed but survived on Wednesday night. And uh, so I just want to offer our prayers and condolences. You know, whatever happens to one of us happens to all of us. So just know that we're with you and we're thinking of you and, and everybody in that facility, brother. Yeah, hey guys, you know what? It's scary times right now because, especially with the coronavirus, you have a lot of uh, people on edge. You know, you got to get that proper education out there. You know, the news is sensationalizing it a lot, and they don't realize how that's affecting our facilities. You know, staff as well as inmates, and right now the officers, the frontline professionals uh, that work inside this profession. You know, medical, food service, classification. You know, the essential personnel. They're going through a lot because they have to kind of manage this this threat but also the sensationalism of the news and it's a lot. So make sure that, you know, your administration is getting the proper information out there because if not, you guys are on that front line and, you know, these inmates are going to be hard to control and my heart goes out to you because not only are you worried about, you know, this threat, but there's going to be an eruption, you know, there it's happening all over. I mean, you know, uh, Lance in Michigan had one, Washington, I was just reading something that happened in Indiana. Um, 
you know, it's really scary times for us. I mean, we have the on-scene threat, but we also have a threat that's kind of building. And, um, you know, again, it's dangerous times, so be on the lookout, please. Uh, I'm sorry, I just made it online. Definitely going to go back and watch this whole interview. Yeah, that's hey, Brian, hey, yeah, guys, if you guys have any questions, guys, by all means, keep asking them. That's, uh, that's uh, but, my buddy Brian from Michigan. He's uh, what yeah, up, Brian? Yeah, we're gonna. That's the guy we're gonna talk to, man. Yeah, you know, I would love to. Yeah, we want to basically kind of create more uh, shows, kind of diversify both our venues. Now, let me ask you a question. Since we have, am I allowed to ask you a question? Is this how it works? Uh, sure. Why not? I want to ask about this. Uh, first of all, this is amazing that you're doing this, but I want I want to kind of know about, uh, you know, what's motivating you to do this? What's this show going to be about? What's your goal? What, what do you want to do with it? Well, it, you know, it, I want to give, you know, my focus is correctional officer health and wellness, and that's what, you know, that's what my book's about, and that's kind of my, what I feel like my specialty, if I have a specialty, is. And so I wanted to just reach out to people and, and to try to answer any questions or just to share some of my stories, uh, how the job has affected me and how I have kind of moved past that or, or try to cope with that. And so I just wanted to do a little live program on Saturday nights and share a couple of stories and take a couple of questions and, uh, and then have some, some guests on and, and you know, that we can kind of focus on, on different things like that and, and, uh, and just yeah, get the word out, man. And I guess part of that inspiration was watching all the stuff that you're doing, and and uh, you know just wanting to be, you know, since I'm the I'm the bat boy on the tear talk team, you know, I wanted to wanted to help out. Well, I tell you, I my, if my Saturdays are open, obviously, I mean, I I've been doing a lot of content lately, but the Saturdays are open, you know, and you want to have another, I'll always help out. I mean, I can even give you, you know, you got my 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 guest as well that I think will be beneficial. I mean, guys, you know what the key here, guys, right now is. The key here really is to share stories. So, I mean, it would be great, you know, if we're able to have more people come on and just kind of give us, and they don't have to be specific. They could just be general stories. I mean, general advice or, you know, tips or stuff that you want to share because, you know, again, um, it's, there's a lot going on in this profession, but there's a lot of good and everybody always hears the negative. So we can even share some good stories. Like, you know, like, Hey, I heard an officer saved an inmate's life the other day, or I heard an officer, you know, broke up, uh, you know, a, a crime on the streets, whatever it was, just something positive uh, that we could share. And then even if it's just amongst this community, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, even if it's just one person watching, it, it, it doesn't matter. The point is, as long as someone's receptive to, to the positive, you know, but it's great. Let me just compliment William here for a second. You know, uh, yeah, let, let me say something, Will. So I'll, I'll tell you how I met Will. I, Will had a book or has a book on the market called When Home Becomes a Housing Unit. And right off the bat, you know, if I was walking into Barnes and Nobles and I saw that, I knew right off the bat, okay, this person works in the system. Like, I mean, that's a title that you and the profession recognize right off the bat. Um, reading the book, seeing the vulnerability uh, in order to write that book, I'm like, wow, this guy is so personal about himself. That's what's going to change other people. You know, that because if you want to change someone, the best people to do it are the people that go through it but are honest with it. You know, they have to open up to a level of complete vulnerability in order to help someone in an honest way, in order to motivate that, you know, that internal change. So right off the bat, when I read the book, it was so brutally honest. And I said, you know what, this is a guy that I have to have involved in my venue because of the brutal honesty. This is a guy that after you read the book, you're, you're, you're a trustworthy individual because you know, if there were things you were going to lie about, that would be something, and you didn't. You were so brutally honest with that book. And when we have done the show, you're able to hit an angle uh, with with my stuff, actually, that hits home with my audience who, you know, needs you, who needs someone to reach out to because, again, I, 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 I haven't gone through that. You have. So I can maybe give general advice, but, you know, I, I don't know the feeling of it. You know, I, I don't know the feeling. I don't know how to express that. Um, so it's great to kind of say, hey, you know what? I got Will. You know, Will's the guy that can get that done. And I think the reason why you're going to create a lot of change in this profession is because you know how to hit the people in this profession. For me, I'm getting to the people. Don't get me wrong. But my motivation is still recognizing the profession. I just realized over the last couple of years that it's about the people first because the people will bring the positivity to the profession. But I had to recognize that you have it in you to have already seen it. So it's going to happen here. The reason why you're going to succeed in what you do 
is because you know what you know the human side of this profession and i think that's going to bring a lot of people out and for the people outside looking in they're going to connect to that they're not going to see people as ceos they're going to see the people first and the people happen to be ceos that's a lot different than the way the, but but that's the perspective that i think is going to change this, the view of this profession i really do it's the perspective that you're providing I appreciate it, man. You know, when I was writing the book and, and the publisher asked me, you know, hey, do you do you have anybody that you would want to uh, write an endorsement or send the book? And I so I wrote down a couple of people and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm going to shoot for the stars here. I'm going to try to get this guy on Tear Talk, see if he'll at least read the book, maybe give me a couple of sentences. I had no idea that it would it would do anything. I mean, this to me, this is like this is like a third grade YMCA basketball coach interviewing Michael Jordan. You know what I mean? I mean that's how that's that's how this feels tonight. So I appreciate you coming on, man. I gotta now I want to do a couple of really quick rapid fire questions, okay? And then and then we're gonna wrap it up for tonight. Uh, we went a little bit later than I wanted to, but I really appreciate it. And I hope that you'll uh, I I, I want to have you back on. I love I mean I just love talking to you, man. You're you're just you're one of those guys you could listen to for, uh, well, for an hour and a half, you know? Is that what it was? Yeah, you know, the other night you were on, and uh, I saw, I got, the, I was eating dinner, I saw the notification that said, Ed Tear Talk's going live, right? So I said, well, I'm going to check in here in a little bit. And I checked in, you were still live, so I watched it for a little bit, and then I was getting ready for work. And then I, and then as I'm walking into work, I'm like, they're still live. It was like four hours or something. You were oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, me and Russ. <laughs> Just with you, me and Russ. Yeah, right, that was right. funny. Right. That was good. So that was all, all hey, right. So, I'm actually nervous right now. What are these rapid questions? Oh man, this is uh this is hard hitting stuff right here. So okay, so rapid fire questions. All right, favorite food? Uh uh chicken fajitas. Chicken fajita. Favorite movie. Oh, um Meet Joe Black. Favorite song. Favorite song. Um Or band. No, no. Uh no, favorite song is Here I Go Again on My Own. Nice, nice. If you could go anywhere in the world right now, where would you go? All right, outside of what we got going on, right? Correct. Um, I always, my dream, my dream wish. I, I always wanted to see the pyramids in Egypt. Nice, nice. That would be nice. What's your favorite book? Uh, my favorite book right now, actually on the market, is uh, I know, man. I don't want to weaken my image, uh, but I, I did like um, the. Uh, it's a book called The Wedding. It's, uh, a, I think, it's a sequel to the Nicholas Sparks book, The Notebook. <laughs> nice. Very good. I'll, I'll put it on my long list. I uh, also like The Alchemist. Okay. By Cole. Yeah, I like that book too. It's a great book. Okay. You should have said uh, When Home Becomes a Housing Unit. So, uh, oh, no. shit. <laughs> All right, last shit. question, uh, Mr. <laughs> Anthony. If you, were, if you could do anything else, if you weren't working in corrections, what would you do? All right, so I'll tell you a little secret. I used to work at Medieval Times, by the way. Um, I was a squire. Uh, I actually wanted to be uh, i wanted to be an actor. Um, I think that changed a little bit to the point now where I'm actually involved in something pretty big right now, uh, which I think will fulfill that need. Uh, we're working on it. Um, but um, I, I wanted to, I, liked, I used to like to act. I used to like to have the attention on me. And then uh, I'm actually glad that I was able to use that skill for this profession in regards to what we're doing now. So, um, yeah, I, that, that's what I would want. Nice, nice, very good. All right, Andy, thank you for coming on the show. And uh, and if you anybody has any questions or comments, uh, I'm going to hang around in the comment section for a while. I know Anthony, uh, he gets on there, and uh, we'll post this up shortly. And uh, hey, Will, we don't get closing thoughts. I give you closing thoughts all the time. Okay, go ahead, closing thoughts. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I appreciate that. I always give out closing thoughts, man. Uh, just again, I, I just want to thank you guys for listening. Uh, I think you guys um, underappreciated, so I'll do whatever I can to make sure that we get the word out about you brave men and women who work in this profession. And I also want, again, going back to Will, uh, I truly want this to be a success. I figure it doesn't matter, you know, how far each one goes because we have each other. You know, I support you, you support me, and together we'll grow. And in the end is... Even if we don't have an impact on the entire profession, maybe it's just that one person in this comment section. That's all that matters. I don't aim to please everyone. I aim to please one. And if that's your goal with doing this, Will, you'll survive and you'll, you'll be a success. So uh, thank you for having me. 
I appreciate it, man, and, and, and I echo those comments, man. It's all, it's all about planting the seed, and it's all about uh, just reaching that one person. You know, if, if we can change one person, maybe they'll change somebody else, and then they'll develop a cure for cancer or something, you know? And don't forget to subscribe to Tear Talk on YouTube. <laughs> right. Subscribe to Tear Talk on YouTube. All right. Everybody, we'll see you next Saturday night. Thank you very much. Disconnected? <laughs>